games going on. Let's take you around the country and go to Boise first. And I said to Clark, why is Utah going to its bench? And you said? They are good. <laughs> their bench averages 23 points a game, Pat. And they're young and they're athletic and they're big. Utah has some very good pieces. And right now they've got a double-digit lead out there in Boise. And at the free throw line, leading by 10 points, 35 to 25, 36 to 25. Over in Austin, Texas, Arkansas, having its way with Texas Southern, 25 to 18, 703, Arkansas and White. Well, this again, a game that will be played up and down, so it has it's, it's vulnerable to runs. The style of play of both of these teams conducive to runs. Arkansas has more talent, and that way, and because of that, I think they're going to end up with a double-digit win here. And up in Albany, St. Peter's returns to Knickerbocker Arena, and where they won 11 days ago, the Metro, and uh, feeling comfortable today so far early against UMass, 10 to 6, St. Peter's in blue. Yeah, they're off to a good, solid start, and again, they really don't have a star player, so they need to do it by committee. And to get confidence, they've got to play from the front and try to control the tempo. If they can maintain a little bit of a lead, then UMass not able to get them into the fast-paced game that they want to play. So a lot of powerhouses playing in the second tier of games here for you here on CBS. And let's go back now to UNC Murray State and Vern Lundquist. Vern? All right, Patrick, thank you very much. And Murray State has scored the last four points, a couple of turnovers, steals, and baskets. They cut the margin to two, and they have the ball after a three second violation they were fortunate they don't let you get very far away because they're athletic enough that they can make plays and, and force turnovers but if the turnovers are still they're quick enough to get to the other end and score and they did they scored two quick buckets off of those steals William Moore number 34 who had the last basket after the steal and the assist Dwayne Davis back on the floor now little pick and roll the shot clock is down to five that's for three raining <laughs> whoa raining, raining that's why they wanted the ball to go the entire time Murray State back on top of North Carolina. Stackhouse. He's a pretty good answer. I was wondering what he was doing. I was saying, where's Jerry Stackhouse? He's got to get his team back into this because, see, he's athletic enough that he, this is his kind of game. I mean, he can get out and run with these people. Rasheed being injured, this is probably not one of his better places to be. No chance. Greg Anderson, I don't think he knew he was behind it. I don't think he, he didn't give him any respect. Oh, you better step up. Oh, look out. <laughs> you cannot take them for granted because they are really quick to the ball. The racers will race. In 1988, Murray State knocked off North Carolina State in a first round game. They were edged by Kansas by only three, and that was the year Kansas won the NCAA championship. <laughs> Gotta watch you travel. Dean Smith looks on as his team falls behind by one. And Kenneth Taylor has checked back on the floor now for Murray State. You know, you could sense Carolina had all of a sudden take the lead a little bit for granted. They were just kind of, the pa passes weren't quite as crisp as they needed to be. And it eventually caught them. Now, he may get this off and in. Oh, just missed. Yes! That counts! That yes! counts! That yes! counts! They're counting that! Yes! He, he can tap it. If it's in, any time, you can tap it. All right, the shot is up. The question is, when it goes down, how much time is there? Can he? Oh, no. Oh, no way. That shouldn't have counted. They missed that one. You see the official in the lower part of the screen saying, yes, it counts. Oh, they missed that one. They're going to check the replay. This is one that they get a chance to do. And they are allowed to do this by rule. Well, well, I see uh, Dean Smith is still there and Scott Egger. They have posted the basket. That's the standby official, Charles Range. Look at it again. Oh, this is no question. That's, it's over now. We'll be back in a moment. 
three games going on, four active games, and uh, there you see it as March Madness unfolds on what we might call Frenetic Friday here at Basketball Land. And we're glad <laughs> you, you like are that one, with huh? us. I did like that one. <laughs> CBS Sports presents Pennzoil at the Half, sponsored by Pennzoil, an official NCAA corporate partner. Hi, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien, along with Clark Kellogg. First of all, that basket is good, 44 to 41. They checked the tape. Actually beat the horn, did not actually beat the clock, but beat the horn, so therefore it counts, and North Carolina down three at the half. Okay, we're going to send everybody out to Austin, where Arkansas leads Texas Southern 38 to 23. Behind the microphones are Dave Sims and Dan Bonner. We are seeing some relentless defense by the Arkansas Razorbacks defending champions here in the NCAA. 38-23, Arkansas with the lead, and many of the fans here rooting for the underdog do not like the call that favors Arkansas. We'll return to Austin in a moment. <laughs> One to Austin, Texas at the Irwin Center. Dave Sims and Dan Bonner with you. 15-point lead for the Razorbacks, the defending national champions. And the defending national champions have just been all over it defensively. And within the last couple of minutes, they've started lighting it up from three-point range, particularly Dwight Stewart. It looked like it was a backcourt violation. Awfully close there. Well, both the ball and the man have to be completely over the mid-court line before you can create a backcourt violation situation, and it didn't happen there. Arkansas on a 13-3-1, a run, largest lead. They're shooting 45% from the field, Texas Southern 29%. Dillard for a three, awfully close, and a rebound to Warren. And this take is it away. Team again. Yeah, right. A double team with the two big guys, Martin and Stewart, taken away at the three-minute mark. What you saw there, pretty much the story of that game. 40 to 23, Arkansas leads that. Let's go up to Albany now, where UMass trails St. Peter's by two. Here's Mike Emmerich and George Raveling. Along with George Raveling, Mike Emmerich from Knickerbocker Arena in Albany. You're reading correctly. Early stages, the underdog St. Peter's with a two-point lead. Boss to four. Mike Friendsley for three. Off of the folk. Brought back now by UMass. UMass likes to push that ball up the floor as quick as they can after a made or a missed shot. They've got Lou Rowe posted on that left box again. Every time he comes down and sets up on that le left box in there. Rowe is fouled. Mo Seagar for the second time is called. One of the things that UMass likes to do, Mike, is they like to go to Lou Rowe early, get him a lot of touches, a lot of scoring opportunities, so that it builds his confidence. Dingle is back in. Dante Bright is out. The big scores, that's almost a cardinal rule, isn't it? Big scores, you want to get them with some points early. We also want to see how uh, St. Peter's is going to defense him in there. And thus far, St. Peter's has been content to stand behind Lou Rowe, let him receive the entry pass, and then try to double down on him. Three air balls so far for you, man. out of Holland. Friendly. UMass ball, 8.45 to go. And UMass trailing by two. Inside for Lou Rowe. Traveling call. The, the problem that, that UMass has here is that they're just continuing to go down inside to Lou Rowe in there because St. Peter's is playing behind him. The temptation now is to keep going to row, and as a result, you don't get the other four players involved in the offense. And it could be difficult to get the other four players back into the offense. Padilla fouled Holmes. Padilla's first. Yeah. 
this looks like that the peak of St. Peter's performance is right now, and UMass almost hasn't gotten into the game yet. Well, and, and I'm not too sure it's not because of UMass's offensive approach. You bring the ball down, you set Lou Rowe on the left box, you swing the ball to the left, you try to go inside the Lou Rowe, and what does it do? It leaves the other four players standing on the perimeter. The more often they do that, the more lethargic they become. And then it transfers to the defensive end of the floor. All right, so St. Peter's leads UMass 18 to 14 now, 8.27 left uh, in the first half. Uh, earlier today, uh, at the end of the UNC Murray State game, 44 to 41 as a halftime score. This is what happened. Let's listen to it. Needs to be, and then eventually caught it. Now he may get this off and in. Oh, just missed. Yes, that count. That yes. count. Well, and you, take you a, heard the horn there. Mm -hmm, you did hear the horn. Obviously, based on that replay, you can see that in fact the basket shouldn't have counted. It is a correctable error according to the rules, but. The officials can't use the replay. They have to confer with themselves. And if, in fact, they think there was an error, then they can correct it. All right. Uh, they'll clear that up a little bit more for you when we go back to that game in a moment. One other score here. Utah leads Long Beach State at halftime, 39-28. to Thanks for watching Penn's All at the Half. I'm Pat O'Brien for Clark Kellogg and all of us here in New York. Enjoy the second half here on CBS. Penn's Oil at the Half was sponsored by Penn's Oil, an official NCAA corporate partner. Oh, offensive player. He's going to come out and challenge the shot right here. He's going to make him shoot it a little higher. Now watch him get out and fill the lane. At 6 foot 11, he fills it. He runs wide, catches the ball, squares up, puts it in off the backboard against multiple pressure. Can be in there right now defensively. 18-16 St. Peter's. Holmes over to DeVos. Ocigar around to Arosa. Holmes driving. Tipped by Arosa and in. St. Peter's by four. St. Peter's is desperately trying to keep this into a half-court game. And they continue to swap baskets, Coach. Well, what, what I think St. Peter's needs to do defensively, and I think they will do it here soon, is they've got to either play up on the high side of the offensive post, man, or they got to front them. They cannot continue to allow those easy entry passes into Rowan Camby. Only one assist so far in the game for UMass. Their average is around 18. Foul underneath. And if that's on Seeger, it's three. Ten points for Orosa. He has been the best of the Peacocks. Camby with eight. The shooting percentage for the Peacocks is above half. And that's because of the, the really sound man-to-man -man defense that St. Peter's is playing. They gave him a look at a 2-3 matchup zone there for a while, but basically St. Peter's is a man-to-man -man defensive team. Seeger with three fouls has to sit, and Jerome Davis is in in his place. Dingle with a little trouble. They work to Camby again. No glass on that shot. Arosa. Folks maneuvered remarkably underneath. Arosa again. Shot it, went to get it. But it is UMass ball. Well, he doesn't stand there admiring a pretty shot, does he? Arosa's never seen a shot he didn't like, Mike. <laughs> But, but but that's part of the, the, his offensive persona. He has an um, uh, amazing uh, confidence in himself that he can score and score on anybody. He's only missed twice. Camby. Jerome Davis up with it, and Friendsley will bring it back. Friendsley's the glue that makes St. Peter's go. He keeps them calm. He keeps them in their half-court offense in there. Make sure everybody gets a few touches of the ball. And he can shoot it. He might be a little too conservative out there offensively now. And just as I said that, he comes up with a big one. 
He's there. a cocky little player. Collectively, St. Peter's chins are thrust right out at UMass. Weeks, got it. St. Peter's lead is back to two at 22-20. Already the count is on. They've had some trouble getting it on the double team, but this time they're able to break it with Jerome Davis leading ahead to Defoe. Seven feet tall, Bosch Defoe. Number 34, tallest player in the history of St. Peter's basketball. Arosa. He is persistent, but this time UMass comes back with a chance to tie the game. Smart play by Dante Bright to back that off. He didn't have a good opportunity to score there. Took it back out and settled it down. Allowed Marcus Camby to get down the floor and get into an interior post position. Jerome Davis with the foul and Ted Fiore's face is red. Ted Ferrari grew up and wanted to be a big league baseball player. Was in the Cincinnati Reds organization, third baseman. Started out like I did, Mike, in coaching. My first coaching job was in the CYO in Philadelphia, and his first coaching job was in the CYO coaching Sacred Heart. It doesn't matter, but do you recall your salary in that first coaching job? I had two Big Macs in the shake. <laughs> but that was if I drove the school bus. Second one doesn't go for Bright, but Weeks puts it up and in. First lead of the game since the early stages for UMass. UMass Stein, the athletic director at St. Peter's, told me he thought he was the best player in the, in the conference. Some battling underneath. Foul called on UMass. Play has stopped here in Albany with the score. The St. Peter's Peacocks leading the Minutemen 24-23. The team they support is behind by one. George, what do you think this game means to St. Peter's? Well, to St. Peter's, I think this is an opportunity game. It's an opportunity to get respect. It's an opportunity to get national exposure. And it's an opportunity to advance to the second round of the NCAA tournament. And UMass? UMass? UMass is playing for the national championship. That's all they're thinking about. Holmes with a fancy move. Padilla brings it back. Kellogg in a hurry. Steps. St. Peter's continues to exploit this press with the baseball pass, which immediately releases all defensive pressure. Along with George Raveling, Mike Emmerich from... Knickerbocker Arena in Albany, New York. St. Peter's leading UMass 24 to 23. Latter stages of the first half. It wouldn't go for Sherrod Jones. Possession arrow. And it is UMass. The storyline here, Mike, is the fact that St. Peter's continues to control the tempo of the game. They, they want to make this a half-court offensive game, and they've worked diligently to do that. And more times than not, if they could successfully attack the press, they've been able to make it a half-court game. And they stopped turning the ball over. So maybe they weren't at their peak in the early stages of this game, but are actually getting better. I think so. They seem to have really calmed down now. They're going to their, to their chief offensive players in there. They're keeping the ball in Holmes' hands as much as possible. Rowe. for UMass. Slow with four points. And Sonny Chaplin brings it up. Yeah. 
Sonny Chapman is a transfer from the University of Texas. He's a really good offensive player. He likes to play facing up. You wouldn't expect many people to think that with 18 minutes played in the first half of this game, that it would be UMass by only one, and that St. Peter's would have had almost all the lead time. Benson. UMass brings it back. Edgar Padilla working it in and getting it back. Tries for three. Rolled down by Sherrod Jones. St. Peter's does a good job of blocking out in there, and they're sending all five players to the defensive board. Foul in the act of shooting. A three-pointer. Coming up on Benzoil at the half, Pat and Clark will have live look-ins from the NCAA tournament. Mike, stepping to the line right now is Randy Holmes. The wrong guy to put at the line. He has made 27 straight foul shots. 27 straight. Let's see if he can extend that streak right now. And being down one, St. Peter certainly needs him to extend that streak. 28. Game tied at 25. Padilla sits with three. carry a lead into the locker room what's the biggest problem Ted Fiore has with his Peacocks at the half well I don't think he has a problem I think that what he's got to do is, is, is to keep them in a present frame of mind he's got to say fellas you executed the game plan perfectly in the first half let's see if we can go out and put 20 more minutes together like that particularly at the defensive end of the floor and particularly blocking out Kellogg's three didn't go, but a foul underneath. The thing that, that concerns me right now, Mike, about UMass is they have very little perimeter offense. St. Peter's has lulled them into believing that they can beat St. Peter's by putting the ball down inside in the post, and as a result, uh, they get no second shots at the basket if the post guy misses. Took UMass to the last minute and seven of this first half to get the one and one going for it. Bro got them both. They call him TV Lou because he's played his best games on national television, and he's going to have to have one of those type of games here today. Steps called on St. Peter's. He's a great kid, Lou Ro. I had him on the Goodwill team this summer. Camby. The jam fails and Holmes brings it back. No. Nope. In the cylinder. Basket interference and it'll go to UMass. Okay, here's a nice lob of Camby in there. Hanging on the rim, but that was a legal play. The player stepped under him. I have no problem with that, neither did the official. Row fouled, and it goes. A great example of how powerful a player Lou Rowe is inside. Okay, here we go on the fast break. Nice stop and go move by Holmes in there. Puts it up on the backboard. Just avoids the block. Touched the ball while it was on the rim in there. Lost and a foul. Dante Bright with his first. Sherrod Jones, number 41 for St. Peter's, Mike, was far more highly recruited for football than basketball. He was recruited by such schools as Miami and NC State as a football player. He's coming to the foul line right now. And when you look at his physical presence, you can understand why Miami wanted him. 6'8", 225. Cinnamon from New Jersey. But it won't go for him, and a foul right off on the rebound. And so back it'll come for a UMass, one and one. 
Well, he's aggressive. Miami could have used that in the ball game. He loves to bang people around. Some concerns for John Calipari at halftime. His team has come back now and is starting to widen. I, I, I really believe right, right right now that UMass is is, is okay. I, I I don't think it's any time to panic right now. In fact, I think Calipari ought to feel pretty fortunate about where they stand right now. Forty and a half. On the shot clock from the game clock. I think St. Peter's will milk this one down pretty good. Jones couldn't get it to go. Now the milking will belong to you, Matt. 16 seconds. Their lead is three. I think they're going to cross screen for Lou Rowe. Bring Lou Rowe to the low post. There he is. For three, Kellogg. Three. What set this play up right here was the Lou Rowe as the threat. They brought him across on a double screen. Mike Frinsley was a little hesitant to come out. Picked it up and shot it. End of the first half, UMass 33, St. Peter's 27. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the NCAA basketball champion continues after this from your local station. Leaf Clover. Our quad showing games all over the country on this frenetic Friday here in March Madness. CBS Sports presents Pennzoil at the Half, sponsored by Pennzoil, an official NCAA corporate partner. And hi again, everybody. I'm Pat O'Brien, along with Clark Kellogg. Welcome to Pennzoil at the Half. UMass leads 33 to 27. Some backcourt problems, though, for John Calipari. Well, they've only got four backcourt points, but they went on an 8-0 run to end the half, lead by six. So they're in pretty good shape right now. We want to get everybody down to Austin because uh, Texas Southern has made a game of this against Arkansas. Now trailing by only four in the second half. Let's go to Dave Sims and Dan Bonner. Dave? We've got plenty of excitement here for you here in Austin. 48-43 Arkansas. Texas Southern making a strong stand against the national champions. Arkansas has come out for the second half a little bit flat, and Texas Southern has really taken advantage of that and taken the game right at the Razorbacks. Crowd here at the Irwin Center. Close to a sellout. Thurman up top. Bangs it off. Granger runs it down. And Granger has been the spark in the second half. Arkansas in the second half. One for five with three turnovers. But here comes that defense. Adams. Deadly three-point shooter. Sets up Jones. Gets it to Dwight. Stewart, he steps back. Another three. Couldn't get it. Thurman kept it alive. But here's Adams. They got numbers. Jones. They leave it for Adams. And he scores. And we're tied at 48. ball game 15 47 to go dave sims dan bonner and dan the uh, texas southern band did a great job turning on the crowd here now the club has and we've got a tie dave with two minutes left to go in the first half arkansas led by 17 texas southern on a 22 to 5 run and for arkansas i think it's time to get the ball inside to corliss williamson but duvar remots in mcdaniel williamson Thurman. Well, and they're that. looking at him, but that's great defense in there by Aaron Ward. Shot clock at seven. Thurman, deep corner. No, rebound. Texas Southern. Anthony Jones. 
you know, the physical play that went on in this basketball game really helped Arkansas early, the physical play out on the perimeter. But now it looks like the physical play on the inside is going in favor of Texas Southern. You get it inside, Whitaker turns. Texas Southern with a 50-48 lead. All year long, the Razorbacks have taken the opponent's best shot, and boy, they're getting the best shot from Texas Southern today. Raymond can't answer. Jones rebound. Crowd rooting for the underdog here at Austin. 24 to 5 run for the Tigers. This is the second time Texas Southern has had the lead, and the biggest Ranger inside got in trouble. Arkansas one for eight. The Razorbacks with one field goal in the second half. And we've played almost six minutes. And this is the way Texas Southern likes to play. One four set with Granger. Step back. Hit it! He's got 12. This looks like a different Arkansas team. The first 18 minutes of the game, they just bullied Texas Southern. Beck trying to create. Razorbacks really look tentative. Corliss. But a blocking foul on Whitaker. I think they got Warren. Warren, number 44 indeed. This is up to 26 to 5 over the last eight minutes, the last two minutes of the first half and the first six minutes of this half. Foul on Warren, his third. Well, let's remember, the basketball game lasts 40 minutes in Texas Southern. They don't have as many big guys as Arkansas has. Scotty Thurman. He's got eight. Texas Southern leads by one. So 13, 42 to go. We go thump, thump throughout the game. The advantage goes to Arkansas. Adams got it back. Travel. Good defense by Arkansas, McDaniel from behind, Robert Moreland. Adams never sees him coming. Adams trying to get by the one guy. Now he's got another guy standing in front of him, runs into Corey Beck, and moves his pivot foot. Razorbacks benefit from that call. Down one, looking to take the lead. The Razorbacks race to the lead on the strength of their defensive intensity, and now Whitaker's going to get called for a foul. And that's a big-time game going on there. 13-23 left, Clark, and uh, Texas Southern leads Arkansas 52-51. Uh, to 51. Another great game going on right now. North Carolina up only two, uh, two over Murray State. Murray State's done a nice job handling the basketball, and as they stay close as this game gets later, the confidence just starts to rise. It could be one that doesn't get done until the end. All right, eight and a half minutes left in that North Carolina game, and it's 56 to 52. And Utah leads Long Beach State now, 57 to 46. Ten minutes to play uh, in that contest there. Thank you for watching Pennzoil at the half. For Clark Kellogg and all of us here, hope you're enjoying your day here on CBS. Happy St. Patrick's Day again. Enjoy the game. Pennzoil at the half was sponsored by Pennzoil an official NCAA corporate partner. Testing that left ankle gingerly, he remains on the bench for North Carolina, and he's got his jacket over his shoulders. I don't know whether we'll see him again or not. Well, I, I, he played, uh, so far he's played a total of 15 minutes, and I'm, I, I think if, if Dean Smith would like to get by without having to play him again, and what Rasheed was trying to do was just to get some more blood to go down there to, to circulate. Quentin Eccles misses that shot of reserves Wicker, who is back in the court now for North Carolina. They lead by two with 7.20 to go. Well, Quentin Eccles is going to take shots. He's got to put it on the floor with Wicker. But I think one of the problems Murray State is going to run into very shortly is that their legs are getting tired, and you can tell how the shots get short. They don't recover back as fast, and it's, it'll start to show up. Wicker with 16, replacing Rasheed Wallace. And the lead is four. Seven minutes to go. Kenneth Taylor is on the floor now for Murray State. Here's Marcus Brown to Rainey. It, it got very quiet. They called timeout. Scott Egger called timeout. I didn't know he had the power to still this crowd like that. That was very impressive. <laughs> 
timeout, Glenn. Why do you think? Well, I think he called it. He was trying to get William Bohr back in the game. They don't want to go down another possession without having a good, uh, good look at the basket. And with more in the game, they've got another weapon out on the floor. Because what you don't want is Rainey to have to take a shot. Because if he's going to the basket and gets called for his fifth, obviously you lose him. William Moore has the ball right now, but this is a, a suddenly tired Murray State team. They have hit two of their last 13 from the field. Moore dishes it to Brown, and Zwicker, oh, the tip goes to Rainey, and then Zwicker knocks it away. And then they got a break on that one, as a matter of fact, because Zwicker knocked it away. Dante Calabria had a chance to go get it. But again, see, 7-2 doesn't get very tired. <laughs> not under the basket. <laughs> I mean, I'm, this is not a good shot for me. I mean, there's three trees. Zwicker hardly has to jump. Jerry Stackhouse is over there. And they knock the ball out of bounds. You do get a new 35 seconds. Then that's what, what Dean Smith is arguing about. They put a fresh 35 on the clock. And Dean is pointing at the shot clock saying, why? <laughs> Well, it, the, the issue would have to be whether he hit the basket or control. He did not hit the basket, and he definitely didn't control it. Neck echoes. Whoa! Mr. That was Stackhouse. Stackhouse. <laughs> oh, boy. And this whistle. I, t I tell you what it was. That one was because Jeff McGinnis got hit in the eye. So the officials, you know, no, hope, don't want to get anyone hurt. So they, they stopped it. Donald Williams gets it back into the hands of Stackhouse, who then gives way to Jeff McKinnis. Six minutes to go in this game. Arkansas leads by three with 9.30 remaining in that one. And St. Peter's and UMass are tied early in the second half. Earlier here this afternoon, Iowa State defeated Florida by three. And the winner of this game gets North Carolina here Sunday afternoon. Serge Zwicker, that's his third, second foul. And it's the seventh team foul. The, the two for 16 is what has become very evident. I don't expect that to get much better. And I would say at this point, if Serge Zwicker is coming out and Pat Sullivan's coming in, it looks as though Dean Smith has made a decision not to put Rasheed Wallace back in the game. Zwicker with a career high of 16 points today. And Rasheed Wallace resting most of this half. Fred Walker in and out. Four-point lead, 5.50 to go. Well, it, Fred Walker's only a 50% foul shooter, so, but what I noticed, I looked on a couple players' face to see their reaction. Those kind of things, when you're in a close game against a big team like North Carolina, can be demoralizing. Stack out. Two more. I mean, and that was tough because Fred Walker was under him, and, and uh, all of a sudden, Jerry Stackhouse is going forward because his feet are going out from under. Stackhouse has 19. Confirmation from Mark Taylor, the trainer, that Wallace is available to come back if needed, but they're going to try and go the distance without him. Rainey, Marcus Brown. They put on quite a performance today. Vincent Rainey and Marcus Brown. And Brown has it again. Back it goes to William Moore, and it still won't fall. That's a big break. Here comes Jerry Stackhouse. Ah! It's the house. It's in the house. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I'm wondering is, I'm sitting next to you. I can see you get turned on. Oh, I what, mean, what's Clark Kellogg doing back in the studio? <laughs> <laughs> He's enjoying it like I am. I got a bird's eye view of it. That's right. Four and a half to go. Brown. Yes! That's for two, but it's still impressive. 66-60, 424 to go. Marcus Brown has McKinnis. Now you gotta remember, the 45 and 35 second clock as it's moved back was put in for North Carolina. When Phil Ford, their assistant coach, sitting over there on the bench, yes, they used to run the four corners. North Carolina was one of the best teams in the country to run the four corners. And you can run it when you've got players like Jerry Stackhouse, who just made a basket and was in a free throw. Uh, you know, when it's time to make plays, you give it to Jerry Stackhouse. He's, he's got a, a great imagination, and he's got the ability to finish with the left. Vincent Rainey just committed his fifth foul. And Vincent Rainey, a sophomore from Memphis, is complete for the, has completed his play for the afternoon. 
He just now realizes it. 21 points. Well, I mean, he can sit up here and argue this one all day long, but the officials have made a, made a call, and, and he's out of the game. But, you know, Jerry Stackhouse is on the foul line, and we were talking about he took a break. Now, Jerry Stackhouse, a little shake up here. He got, got shaken up pretty good. There's no question. My goodness. He got what he got was a heck of a shot from Dante Calabria. I don't know. They called that foul on Rainey? Yeah, they did, but I'll tell you why they did. Well, when Calabria he, knocked him down. He did. He drilled him, but the first thing that happened was when, when Jerry Stackhouse did the shake, as he started to go up, there was a right hand. Okay. I could see it. That pushed Jerry Stackhouse, and then Rainey's, after he pushed him, he kept going, and he ran into Dante. Okay. You're my guru. Take my word for it. I, I, I am. I believe. We're going to give you a chance to prove it. Oh, hey, this is this is a no-brainer. I can tell you that. <laughs> the three-point play increases the lead to nine. North Carolina for Murray State. Here's Marcus Brown. Back to William Moore. Yes! Well, he, he's the one that's got to start making shots. They're not going to let Mar uh, Marcus Brown make many more shots. They're running two people after him. 69-63 with 340 remaining. Williams looks for Zwicker, loses it, throw it away. That's got Dean Smith up off the bench and the Murray State Band applauding. Well, he was what he's really just trying to remind Jeff. You got to be careful where you throw big people the ball. That that pass was going out of bounds, and you got a 7-2 guy that's got to get his weight shifted and all that. Those kind of mistakes you don't, you can't afford to make. This is Kenneth Taylor at the point now, number 10. 3.20 to go in the ball game. North Carolina up by six over Murray State. The racers, winners of eight in a row. Racing the North Carolina team that came in 24 and 5. The racers have been racing. Oh, oh, D. oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they got Jerry uh, McGinnis on the push. Oh, they call it on Williams? Donald Williams. Yep. How's that North Carolina's number 21? Donald Williams. That's his first. And it's the eighth team foul. And Marcus Brown will go to the line. Matt Sullivan quickly back on for the Tar Heels. And Serge Swicker receives the plaudits of his teammates and assistant coaches as he sits down. Yeah, they got him out of the game because you need somebody to handle the ball. And they, they can't afford to have this to have Marcus Brown make two foul shots. He's an 89% foul shooter. And then have another one and not get it done. Here's Marcus Brown. Not to belabor the point, but let's go back and take a look at that fifth foul on Rainey. Right there. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I, would I kid you? There's no question. He pushed him. See, he oh, pushed picky. him. Oh, picky. Oh, picky. If you push him, man, if you push him anytime you push him and he's going up for a shot, they're going to call it. Okay. Now, yeah, he got drilled. I, I won't say he didn't get drilled, <laughs> but that was kind of after the fact. All right. <laughs> okay. So it was a dead ball, so they couldn't call that one. You're still my guru. <laughs> <laughs> Three minutes to go in this one. Four-point game. 69-65. Although I still think it was nitpicking. Yeah, you wouldn't think it was nitpicking <laughs> if you're going up for a jump shot and somebody shoved you with a hand. Okay. I know, you did that yesterday. I yeah, know, that's I, right. I <laughs> okay. Well, I took you to the hoop. Yeah, you did. It dumped on me. Yeah. Jerry Stackhouse style. In my dreams. <laughs> Five on the shot clock. McKinnis. Oh, he won't get it all. Oh, Williams. Oh, big. Does he get it? And a foul. Wow. Oh, good play by Calabria. Good play. To get in there, you got him taking a tough shot, and he gets in there. Swicker's going to come back on now, and Calabria will shoot a free throw. That's the second foul on Quinn and Eccles. Swicker on for Sullivan. 69 65. 225, 26 remaining. Well, you normally don't have to worry about Calabria making foul shots. Anybody that shoots at 52% from the field. Green music. Murray State with two timeouts left. UNC with three. Team fouls 10 and 8. And the possession arrow favors North Carolina. They are up now by six. 71-65 with 2.26 to go. And time has been called. North Carolina. 
Vincent Rainey, who leads all scorers for Murray State, is on the bench with his fifth foul. Kenneth Taylor, William Moore at the guards right now. Marcus Brown fights up the right side. North Carolina's gone into a triangle in two. What they've done is they put a man on both Brown and Moore, and everybody else is in a zone. I mean, that's how concerned they are about those guys, principally because you're talking two three-pointers, and it's a tied game. We're under two minutes remaining. Williams and Calabria joined by Swicker, Stackhouse, and McGinnis for North Carolina. Rasheed Wallace has rested most of this half. And I think it's a good idea they'll, because, you know, if it goes as the game is now and you start talking about playing against Iowa State, you'll need Rasheed Wallace because you've got to get somebody inside. Oh, oh, boy. What a tough shot. The lead is 9, 74-65. Back it comes to Kenneth Taylor. Brown. Yes. And they're going to get a timeout right away. Timeout, Murray State. Murray State calls time. They have one left. State 74-68. Rasheed Wallace having a chance to rest that sprained left ankle much this half. And Serge Swicker was an outstanding effort today off the bench. Oh, Swicker's been huge for them because he's been he scored he, and, and he's blocked shots. But since he's uh, since Wallace has gone out of the game, North Carolina has scored outscored um, Murray State 26 to 17. That was a late call, but it is a good call. Kenneth that, Taylor. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about it. It was a little bit late, but it was a good call. To everybody but Scott Eggers. It's on Murray State's number 10, Kenneth Taylor. Jerry Stackhouse is going to come to the bass. Now, watch you get it. I mean, that can be called there. Whoa. I stand corrected. My. If they were going to call one, they had a chance to call him early. But the, that time, that was the ball. It did indeed appear so. Stackhouse at the line, though, with 68 seconds remaining. You don't like saying a minute, eight, two minutes? I heard, you know, you know, there were two minutes before and 120 seconds. What, what's with that? Just an old Swedish tradition. Ah. <laughs> okay, I'm just, just curious. <laughs> Stack out. <laughs> Here's Brown. Now he's got one minute left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's much better. <laughs> That's Brown. Marcus Brown's putting some pressure on him, trying to get there quick. I got it. I understand it now. Okay. <laughs> My lot in life is not to confuse you. Yeah, please don't. You know, There's Wicker. And doesn't, take <laughs> doesn't take much. Doesn't take much. 53.2 seconds to go in the game. North Carolina, not necessarily a good free throw shooting team, but today they've been outstanding from the line. Well, I, I would go you one better. They're not a very good shooting team. I wouldn't say not necessarily. They're not. If you shoot 67%, that's not good. And what North Carolina has to be careful, uh, that may be one of the things that gets them down the line. MSU has used its last timeout. but they haven't lost heart. Murray State cheerleaders, 75-70. And just, it, this always happens. You go to a John Goodman look-alike, <laughs> and he puts his puppet down. Oh, and right? he talks to it, no yeah. less. <laughs> this guy is, is not, has not been paying attention in class. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zerg Swicker at the line. Arkansas Razorbacks playing down in Austin in the Midwest first round game. They've got their hands full, too. Ho oh, ho. Scott Edgar's former boss, Nolan Richardson, having his hands full. Texas Southern commends a 15 seed. 77 70 is the score here. For three, Kenneth Taylor, no. Flicker with another rebound. And they, they were having trouble getting to the ball. Nine rebounds for. The seven foot two inch young man from the Netherlands. Well, I mean, a North Carolina fans and even Jerry Stackhouse are standing up and they're smiling at this young man because he's had such a big game for them. You know, North Carolina not knowing what exactly was going to happen without Rasheed Will Wallace. The, the players knew that Rasheed wasn't going to play much because they, they've been through practice with him and, you know, guys just know. Sophomore Serge Swicker at the line. 
Terry struck it in two. 19 points. Previous career high, 13 against VMI. Well, Stackhouse. Foul by Kenneth Taylor. Uh, no, they called it because oh. uh, Dante Calabria went down on the side. I mean, an official actually called that. Over to Austin, where Arkansas and Texas Southern are in a one-point game. Let's go to Dave Sims. The defending national champions being tested mightily. Thurman, three, no! It's a foul against Nick Daniel. That's the 10th team foul. No original foul. This team Nick Daniel pick up his third foul. 57.9 seconds remaining. Big, big free throws coming up right here for Adams, a 63% free throw shooter. The Texas Southern Tigers on the edge, 57.9 of a monumental upset of the defending national champions. 13 points for Adams. Now he's one back in battle. One for three from the free throw line. He's got one more. It... Extraordinary game for the Tigers of Texas Southern. Adams missed two of them badly. A wasted opportunity for Kevin Adams in Texas Southern. Texas Southern has missed three of their last seven free throws. The defending national champion, Arkansas Razorbacks by one in the final 40 seconds here in Austin, Texas. You don't want to foul here. You don't want to foul. But you've got to get a stop. Team fouls, both in the double bonus. Williamson really looking for the ball. 30 seconds to go. Six in the shot clock. Knocked away. And a foul. A foul. With on Mallon and Ray. With five seconds left on the shot clock, Williamson, Six ten feet from the basket, the basket the with three. double teams this around him. That's just not a good foul, but Robert Moreland can't fault the effort of Mary and Ray. These kids playing hard. Mary and Ray just doing everything he can to so keep the ball away from Texas Williamson. This has been a classic battle most of the game, and there's Williamson about ten feet from the basket. is back to the hoop. The shot clock running down, but Ray commits the foul. Williamson will have two free throws. And we've got 26.9 seconds. Even if he makes them both, Texas Southern can tie it with a three. Yes, they can. Carlos Williamson with 17 points. Robert Moreland has seen his club battle ferociously after being put on the ropes early in the game. This guy is just a big-time player right That's all he's here. doing. <laughs> Two-time SEC Player of the Year, second-team All-American. 26.9 seconds to go. A major sweat for Arkansas. And a good trip for Carlos. He bangs him two. Three-point game. Knocked out of bounds by Beck. And Arkansas has forced so many turnovers on inbounds passes. Robert Moreland going to his bench, get some more quickness in there. Randy Bolden coming into the game. Texas Southern has turned it over 20 times. Bolden is a ball handler. He's also a three-point shooter. 26.1 seconds to go. Reggie Garrett going to come in. Reggie, good defender. He'll take the place of Dwight Stewart. More quickness for Nolan Richardson's Razorbacks. You don't necessarily have to go for a three in this situation. They're down three. Texas Southern, nine for 25 from three-point range today. There's Granger. Whatever you do, though, you've got to get it done quickly. Bolden, back to Kevin Granger. Bolden, Granger's probably going to be the man. Puts it on the floor. Beck, working hard. Can't get it. Loose ball. Bolden has five seconds. He lets it go. And it's a whistle. He's Williamson has just fouled out of the ball game with 6.1 seconds to go. And the man he just sent to the free throw line, he's a freshman, Randy Bolden, but he's the leading free throw shooter 
in the SWAC this year. He's an 80% free throw shooter going to the line. Talk about pressure for a freshman. Against the defending national champions, Randy Bolden has an unbelievable opportunity. Williamson has just fouled out. Randy Bolden, a freshman from Jackson, Mississippi. He went to Forest Hill High School, the Southwestern Athletic Conference freshman of the year, at 79% from the line. He's one for one today. 6.1 seconds left. If he makes all three, and only if he makes all three, will we be tied? Here we go, one of the biggest moments of the year. There's one. <laughs> one down, two to go. Two, landed home, touching all the rim. And Robert Moreland was just told, to, told his players if he makes it, he wants a timeout. Only defending champion to lose first round. In he does it. They get the rebound. Thurman, it's Arkansas ball with 3.8 seconds to go. So this is Arkansas number three, Alex Dillard. This has been a monumental There's game. Out of the floor. Come on back for the final 3.8 Arkansas by one. Arkansas back to inbound, leading by one, 3.8 seconds to go. And they foul Corey Beck, 3.1 seconds to go. Well, of course, the situation that you create is very, very, very difficult for Texas Southern right now. Granger picks up his fourth personal foul. Beck goes to the free throw line. If he knocks them both home, Texas Southern can still tie with a three. One timeout remaining. Returning for Texas Southern. Double bonus in effect for Texas Southern with the arrow. Returning for Arkansas, number 23. Arkansas had a 17 point lead. Beck saw, saw Texas Southern go on the lead by number four a couple of times. Beck, a 67% free throw shooter. Nolan Richardson thinks more than 0.7 seconds should have run off that clock. It was 3 8 when they inbounded. Probably as a case. Shooting two shots. Two shots. Here's Corey Beck. That looks short right out of his hand. There's only 3.1 seconds left in the game. That's not much time. It is enough time, however, as Texas Southern calls timeout to get a good shot. That's what pressure looks like when you're the defending national champions and you've been taking to, taken to the limit. Well, for Texas Southern, if there's a miss here, they have to get the rebound. They got to block out. They got to handle the ball cleanly. Beck missed it on purpose. Now they're going to go. There's Whitaker. He's going to have to put it up. He's going to get it off. Did not get it off. And Arkansas survives a monumental scare from Texas Southern. 79 to 78. What a game. Nolan Richardson Buck wasted a 17-point lead. Texas Southern had a chance. They missed three of their last five from the free throw line. Shot just 15 of 24 from the line for the game. That's 63%, well below their 68% for the season, which was best in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Texas Southern, you just simply can't fault the effort. Tremendous intensity, tremendous toughness, tremendous poise. But Arkansas, they advance with a great job today. Good toughness by the Razorbacks down the stretch. Nolan Richardson Club will advance to play Syracuse on Sunday. And later on tonight from Austin, it'll be a great game. Memphis and Louisville, Purdue, and Wisconsin Green Bay.
The genuine Chevrolet players of the game are Kevin Granger from Texas Southern and Dwight Stewart from Arkansas. For Dan Bonner, I'm Dave Sims. The final, Arkansas wins it 79 to 78. Pat O'Brien will be coming your way from New York. Welcome back to the Road to the Final Four. I'm Pat O'Brien along with Clark Kellogg. Boy, what a game, folks. If you're an Arkansas fan, you're still uh, reaching for that glass of water or whatever. Let's go back to Dave Sims and Dan Bonner. They got some interviews for us. Dave? Nolan Richardson, you, you were in our New York studios. All right, Dave, thank you. I've been, been around basketball for quite a while. What Nolan Richardson was really trying to say is, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all about survival at this point, Pat. Obviously, you don't get anything for style points. I thought Arkansas's defense in the first half is the way they've got to try to play for 35, 37 minutes. And Texas Southern, you've got to give them a tremendous amount of credit. They continued to fight throughout that game. A lot of credit. Came within a point and a look of beating uh, <laughs> Arkansas. The road to the Final Four will roll on from New York City right after this. Stay with us. Boy, Georgetown. Xavier's got a, a wonderful basketball team. It's interesting, Pete Gill and the coach at Providence, they were talking to him about Xavier and their great run, and he's, of course, he'd been there for nine years. He said, yeah, they're getting coaching this year. Well, <laughs> Providence <laughs> College is getting coaching, too. Sonny Chapman is in for Mo Seagar. One minute to go, second half. Curry's coaching like it's a one-point game there. He's really interesting, up. yeah. He's all over him about execution there. He was yelling to Dingle, get out on the floor, get out on the floor. Six on the shot clock, Weeks and Kellogg. Now the game clock is the shot clock, and it's a matter of time. But St. Peter's can be proud of, uh, of the effort that they put out here to, in this game. They don't have anything to be ashamed of. Fans are standing all over the Knickerbocker Arena right now. They have to play another five seconds, and then the congratulations will start. Kellogg and Griffiths. The genuine Chevrolet players of the game, Marcus Camby from UMass, Luis Arosa from St. Peter's. Our congratulations to them. Congratulations to both teams. These wonderful schools, but just worn out at the end with St. Peter's. They had no baskets in the last 11 minutes and 12 seconds. And so advancing today here in Albany, Stanford and UMass. Tonight, Villanova and Old Dominion, Tulsa and Illinois. Now back to Pat O'Brien in our studios in New York. By the way, that's not my bracket I'm erasing. <laughs> yes, it is. Let's, yes, uh, it tell is. everybody what's going to happen later on tonight. About 7.30, we come back on. And Indiana and Missouri, Norm Stewart and Bob Knight have never coached against each other, believe it or not. Old Dominion and Villanova, Louisville and Memphis, and Weber State against Sean Respert and Michigan State. Then later at 9.55, Xavier of Ohio against Allen Iverson and Georgetown, Florida International, UCLA, Purdue, Wisconsin, Green Bay, and Illinois, Tulsa. Uh, we're not promising, but we think, we hope, good games for you. Uh, just finished here. Uh, UMass finally got it together. It took them a while, didn't it, uh, Clark? 68-51 uh, yeah. to 51 over St. Peter's, and so the University of Massachusetts advances. But uh, St. Peter's hung in there for a long time. They did. They hung in for a while, but when they crashed, they crashed hard. UMass went on a 20-2 to two run to end the game. And they advanced. advanced. That's the way you do it. The road to the Final Four will continue from New York City and points all across this country right after this. Stay with us. First round scare, but they prevailed 80 to 70 with an assist from their sophomore center. Big fella, Serge Wicker, 19 points, nine boards, a block shot off the bench. Carolina showed a little depth today. 
And Utah beat Long Beach State 76 to 64. Uh, most of you will see you at 7.30 tonight. We begin our second tier in night games. Jim Nance will be sitting here. For those of you expecting Santa Clara, Mississippi State, we'll be back after this word from your local station. Stay with us. And hi again, everybody. Jim Nance along with Special K, Clark Kellogg. Welcome to night two on the road to the Final Four, CBS Sports exclusive continuing coverage of the NCAA basketball tournament. It has been a St. Patrick's Day parade of close games in the afternoon. Yeah, you need to make your free throws and execute down the stretch, otherwise you're out of here. Arkansas, North Carolina, and UMass all had tight ones during the day. Tonight, another first-round doubleheader. Most of you are going to see Indiana against Missouri, a classic 8-9 matchup in the West. Then, at about 9.55 Eastern time, our late games will tip. Most of you will see Z Xavier and Georgetown in Southeast region play. The last final from the afternoon, Mississippi State advanced its first win in the tournament since 1963, behind 19 points from Darrell Wilson. Now, here's the Carolina game that was so close. Controversial play at the end of the first half against Murray State. Take a look at this. You see the basket was clearly after the buzzer. Initially, the officials counted it. They conferred, conferred with one another. After the end of halftime, we're able to de determine that that was not good. Took away the two points. Heels came back from six down in the second half. How about UMass? Down late in the game, 49-48. And then St. Peter's did not hit a basket from the floor in the last 11 minutes. A win there for UMass, 68-51. Meanwhile, defending national champion Arkansas, up one. Beck misses. This shot would take place after the horn. But Texas Southern missed four free throws in the last minute. And the Razorbacks escaped with a one-point victory. And we'll continue on the road to the Final Four on CBS after this word from your local station. The Capitals, our walk around the country includes Old Dominion versus number three, Villanova in the east. Everybody else will start with Weber State and Michigan State in the southeast down in Tallahassee. And for those of you expecting Indiana, Missouri, we'll deliver you to Boise in time for your tip at about 7.50. Louisville and Memphis in the Midwest will start in Austin, at the top of the hour. In the meantime, fasten your seatbelts. Time to hitch a ride on the road to the Final Four. CBS Sports exclusive coverage of the first round of the NCAA Basketball Championship is sponsored by Saturn, Bud Light, Men in Speed Stick, and by Midas. From the Tallahassee Leon County Civic Center in Tallahassee, Florida, it's a Southeast Region first round encounter between the third seeded Michigan State Spartans out of East Lansing as they host from the Big Sky Conference the Weber State Wildcats who come in with a number 14 seed. Earlier today, Iowa State and North Carolina advanced to Sunday's second round game. The winner of this game everyone I'm Mike Emmerich along with George Rabbling we call him the coach after 34 years coaching teams why not coach what did you think of the matinee games here well the afternoon games the road to victory was paid he's going his way out he's thinking a little bit of like to think about Al McGuire coach Al McGuire who went out won a championship on his way out but if he's going to do it it's going to rest on the back of his star Sean Rester one of the leading scorers in the country and this guy shoots it with range and we get a chance to see him in tournament play tonight Sean, Sean Resford coming in with a 25.5 points per game average. And Eric Snow in the backcourt has really been the, uh, the the catalyst to help to go along with Resford. Well, I really don't think they can get along without Eric Snow because he's the guy that finds Sean Resford in position to knock down shots. And from the Big Sky Conference, it's Ruben Renhard, Memhard rather, the player of the year in the Big Sky Conference. For Weber State tonight, Kirk Smith, Jimmy DeGraffenreed, Jeff Lentner, Ruben Memhard, and Lewis Lofton. And for Michigan State, John Garavaglia, Quentin Brooks, Jamie Fike, and the backcourt duo of Respert and Eric Snow. Weber State out of Ogden, Utah, about a 35-minute drive north of Salt Lake. They were a little curious as to why as a 14th seed they came east of the Mississippi River, but here they are. 
there's a whole lot of people just happy to get in. And I think if you, you cut to it and you talk to Ruben Nebhardt and the rest of the Wildcats, they will tell you they're happy to be here. What they're going to have to do is be able to come. And the animated and successful Steve Lapis, candidate for James Smith, Naismith Coach of the Year, his first visit to March Madness with the Wildcats in his third year at Villanova. The officials for our game, the referee. Classic game, December of 79. That was one year after Michigan State won the national title. So Westbrook comes out right away and makes a three-pointer. Now, what makes that really interesting, they're playing kind of a, a box in one or a diamond in one, if you will, which means four men are in a zone in the shape of a diamond. They had one person that time just trying to find out where Sean Westbrook was going to go. It's Lewis Lofton that has the pass. This is to grab and read for three, and he shoots an air ball. Rebound, Eric Snow, Quentin Brooks at the other end. He saves it, but it goes right in the hands of Nimhart. Weaver State, champions, co-champs, and actually the Big Sky Conference, a title they shared with Montana, and then they defeated the Montana Grizzlies in the championship tournament game. You need to see a little bit of here early, the way these shots are going for um, Weaver State, that they're a little nervous. He got fouled. There's no doubt about it. He does not keep the ball that, that short. He got fouled, and he's telling the official going down. Westbrook turned around immediately and got no call. Ruben Nemhard, a senior from Bronx, New York, guarded by Eric Snow, Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. The Graffin Reed. Up. Nope. Rebound. <laughs> They'll keep shooting. This is why I expect Michigan State to have an advantage once they start going inside. That is the second turnover against Michigan State, however. Weber State located in Ogden, 13,500, and they are the tournament champions of the Big Sky. Their head coach, Ron A. Beglin, who was a fine player for Brigham Young and Stan Watts in 1962, his fourth year now at Weber State. In 34 years as a coach, he's never had a losing season. Snow. Good. So far, you've seen him be able to, Michigan State be able to run out, knock down the three. I think Weber State has to get accustomed to the fact that they're playing against guys who may be a little bigger, a little quicker, so that means you've got to be sharper in, in making passes and going to the basket. Memhart. Snow backs up. Memhart takes it all the way, and Weber State is off the side. 5-2. At the other end, Michigan State runs. You know, Sean Respick can do a lot of things. He can get it up in the break, and he pushes the ball up, and you see Snow get the finish that time. That's a little reverse of what normally happens, and you normally also see Snow throw to Respick for a jump shot as opposed to a layup. I want to advise many of you that we'll be taking you to Boise, Idaho for the Indiana-Missouri game. That's got a 7.50 Eastern time tip, and many of you will watch that game tonight. Quentin Brooks will shoot one more. Michigan State second in the Big Ten to a Purdue team that came on very strong at the end. They suffered a, Michigan State that is, suffered a tough loss to Iowa in the next to last game, 79-78. Then came back with a huge win at home in Judd Heathcote's final game in East Lansing against Wisconsin. A game that ultimately helped cost Stan Van Gundy his job. Here's the putback, and it's good. And he got pushed in the back. You got to be aware of, first of all, Ruben Nebhar is, is not going to be afraid once you think about it, because this is a kid from <laughs> DeWitt Clinton in, in the Bronx, New York. You see him right here, go back and push the shot in, but it looked as though Jamie Fike got his hand on him and pushed him in the back. He's not going to be afraid to play against these guys. He's played against guys like this most of his career. I just don't think his teammates have done it. Nebhar completes a three-point play and makes it a 6-5 ball game with 17-27 to go first half. Eric Snow will walk it up. Respert posting up down low. They, they've got the, the diamond in one. Sean Respert's being guarded by Lewis Lofton. But you got to watch for the lobs become available. There are a lot of angles when you play those kind of defenses. Garavaglia. And that's because Eric Snow was able to penetrate one of those angles and throw it back to Garavaglia. 
All right, folks, we'll keep you posted on that game. Michigan State, one of four Big Ten teams in action tonight. Big Ten lost two teams yesterday, both Michigan and Minnesota. Meanwhile, we're firing up the Boise site because another Big Ten team is ready to tangle. Indiana and Missouri, Bob Knight and Norm Stewart will meet for the first time when we continue in a moment. Idaho for the third of our four games today in the West Region's first round. This afternoon, we saw two teams advance tonight, Indiana and Missouri, perhaps the best matchup in the entire first round. This afternoon, Utah defeated Long Beach State, and Mississippi State, the number five seed, defeated Santa Clara to move in against Utah in the second round. Following Missouri-Indiana, it'll be UCLA and Florida International. And believe it or not, this will be the first matchup between this man, Bob Knight, the coach of the Indiana Hoosiers, and Norm Stewart, the coach of the Missouri Tigers. 28 years for Stewart, 24 years at Indiana for Knight, 659 wins each, and yet they have never met. Well, I, I tell you what, they're both uh, champs in our profession. Everyone uh, respects them. I think that Coach Knight has his team in the right swing now. I think that he's more or less than hammering them. He's kind of patting the fannies of the freshmen. And if they're going to win today, it's going to be the freshmen they are going to win for them. Well, this Indiana team has got a spectacular player by the name of Alan Henderson. And I think uh, this is a guy who every night, because they're such a young team, is a key player for them. Well, Alan, what he does after that injury last year, he was well, but he still had the scar on his head. Now he's completely well, and he's going to end up just about every game guaranteeing you about 20 points and 11, 12 rebounds. 23.7 he brings into this game as the scoring leader for Indiana. Paul Olenny is the scoring leader for the Missouri Tigers, and he's more than just a scorer. He must score more than his average. He, he'll dish and he'll go for the ball. He can tell with a bandage on his nose. He's, uh, he just puts his body out there every time he plays. But he has to have a huge offensive game for the Tigers to win. Julian Winfield, another key player for the Tigers, kind of a do-it-all guy for them and a great defensive player. Two uh, changes in the starting lineup for the Hoosiers. At guard, Steve Hart and Neil Reed, we expect, will be in Charlie Miller's uh, spot. For more on the changes and the reasons why, let's go to our reporter, Michelle DeFoya. All right, guys. Well, Steve Hart will be starting in place of Michael Herman, partly because Michael Herman hasn't been feeling that well, also because Hart has been playing very, very well in practice this week, and they think he is the best defensive stopper to play against uh, Paul Olini this afternoon. Gentlemen. Thanks, Michelle. And it is Neil Reed also in the lineup at guard, and he's playing with a sore shoulder in which he wears a football pad to protect it from the season, uh, an earlier injury in the season. And Missouri in white. The Hoosiers in red were just underway. Winfield in traffic in the lane, and we got to jump on. The arrow is in favor of the Tigers. Officials tonight, John Claggerty, Carl Hess, and Michael Kitts. Appropriate, a guy named Claggerty is one of the officials on a March 17th date. Well, Haley that time should have bounced that ball into Winfield. Winfield had perfect position. Ooh, Alini, they... and he missed it from underneath. Taken away by Henderson. Henderson, six foot nine. In Indianapolis, Indiana. Henderson wants to, I mean, excuse me, Henderson, IU wants to start a ball movement, back screens, side screens, constantly screening. Henderson missing on his first attempt of the ball game. That is Sutherland, Sutherland off the front iron. Rebounded by the Tigers, Grimm. And Winfield will organize things for Mizzou. One of the big problems with Mizzou is that they go on extended droughts during ball games. They're a physical ball club, but they go in these four or five minute uh, spurts if they don't score a point. Winfield in and out. Battle for the rebound, and Sutherland comes away with it. Lenny, Winfield, Sutherland, starts it over again. Derek Grimm. They're kind of letting Winfield roll wherever he wants. 
Sutherland with that taped right elbow. He claims that it's 100%, but nobody quite believes that. Grim come down kind of gingerly on his foot that time. He did. Derek Grimm, the sophomore from Morton, Illinois. Good three-point shooter at 45%. They'll need his action scoring as well. And neither team able to find a bucket yet here, each with two tries. Henderson had two good looks. Just didn't drain them. He will. <laughs> That's Brian Evans, the junior from Terre Haute, Indiana. That's the man you got to stay up on. Hoosiers consider him their best pure shooter. And he's coming off a shoulder injury. We're tied at two. Well, I think Norm Stewart feels good because he told me yesterday that he dreamt that his team wouldn't score for the whole 40 minutes. He tied at three with those pair of three-pointers, and now that's Reed driving for a 5-3 Indiana lead. Lenny in traffic. Travel yeah. called. Yeah, he took two small steps and one large one. Neil Reed, a freshman from Metairie, Louisiana. And a foul call. First of the game. Goes to Sutherland. Sutherland with an elbow injury. Suffered back on February 18th. And he's a good three-point shooter. 39 percenter. And there's no question it's had some effect on uh, his play from that range uh, since the injury. But he's a gamer and says he's uh, ready to go tonight. Evans. Yeah, you come out on Evans and he'll slash in there. 7-3 Indiana lead. 6-8 junior. Averaging 17.1 a game. Olenny in and out. Rebound by Winfield. Winfield is short. Henderson knocks it loose. Make it uh, Andre Patterson knocking it out of bounds. Number 45. 6-8 freshman from Abilene, Texas. Player of the year in Texas high school basketball last year. Average 27-3 a game and 13-7 rebounds. Nearly 14 rebounds a game by Andre Patterson. Win that Player of the Year award in Texas. Very seldom the coach ever start uh, freshmen. And some, some games this year he started three freshmen in the starting lineup. Indiana plays much better from a lead. They have a problem if they fall behind. 7-3, who's your lead at this point? 16.58 to go. Reed back quickly for the Hoosiers inside for Alan Henderson and he's fouled by Moore, Kendrick Moore. Kendrick Moore, a freshman from Hartford, Connecticut. First on him. There's Neil Reed. You can see that uh, shoulder pad underneath his sweatshirt and jersey on his right shoulder. And his shooting, like Sutherland's, has been hampered. Ooh, boy, yes, he's on fire. Three for three. Brian Evans, seven points. Nine three, who's your lead? The lead four outside saying, hey, we'll test you out there. But you let one fly. Kendrick Moore, a teammate of Marcus Camby. Down low on the block. You look at the inside position that Evans is getting. Well, that helps uh, Henderson because with Henderson, what IU needs is another scorer down low on the blocks at least to get 10 to 12 points. Because they're double teaming on the Henderson every time he catches the ball. Evans with his first miss and then Moore misses for Missouri. Back quickly as Hart. Evans for Henderson. Cross to Reed. Evans. Four for four. Five alarm fire. Two from three point. Slam. 12-3 Indiana lead. Titans want to make it more physical out there. Stewart on his feet at the Missouri bench. Sutherland bouncing in for Haley. Sammy Haley, one of the twins. 
And Moore lets fly off the front rim, and it's rebounded by Reed. Bobby Knight seems to figure that Moore can't hit from out there because they give him a tunnel of uh, room. Mississippi, uh, uh, Missouri, one of ten from the field early in the game here. Mississippi State, of course, advancing this afternoon with a over Santa Clara. Now look at that one. We might be watching the offensive career game. 12-3. It's been all Bryant Evans of Indiana. How many points has he got? He's got 12 now. 12 points in five minutes. That's 96 points for the game. <laughs> Derek Grimm. Will Chamberlain will be starting to worry about him. Will has the rick at the NBA, 100 points in the game. Patterson kicks it back out. Dallin Henderson hitting at the arc. Just clear off that side. Henderson can take Haley one on one. <laughs> he nearly made that one without even seeing the basket. 14 to 6, an eight point lead. Kendrick Moore, that's a three. That was more Henderson than the foul on him, boy. 14 to 9. Matt Reed. A lot of movement on the weak side of the court. Vertical picks, horizontal picks, line picks up and down. Reed from long range, Haley rebounds. Kendrick Moore. The freshman from Hartford has five points. Getting two in a row. And a three-point lead for the Hoosiers. Anderson is fouled by Haley. Here's the man of the moment, Brian Evans. Has always been an outstanding shooter. Last year he had injuries, also had injuries the year before. Sammy Haley picked up the foul as first. 13.09 to go, first half. Anderson and Evans are, are really cooking, and their combined scoring is 35 or better between them. Indiana's 18 and 4. Not quite the same when they don't have those kind of combined numbers. And so far, Evans is doing it by himself. Well, they, they're, they're great forwards, but they pay more attention to Henderson. Now they've got to adjust because Evans having such a hot hand. Hoosiers by three. And there's Alan Henderson. A real good look. Nobody on him, but it's in and out. Rebounded by Haley. Chip Walter, number 10, in the guard for the Missouri Tigers, a sophomore. Third turnover by the Tigers of Mizzou. Fell asleep on those screens down low. Steve Hart, 6'3", sophomore from Terre Haute, 16-11. Tigers got to get Winfield into this ball game. Winfield's their best athlete. Here he goes. He's going to do something. Bumped into Steve Hart. Winfield's their glue. And I think that Henderson's having a tough job because Winfield is not that tall compared to Henderson. Winfield at 6'5", been bothered with a uh, quad problem, a quadricep muscle, and missed four games, and he's our best leaper, so he's not quite back to full form. When he was out, uh, Missouri lost all four games. They just need him, simply. He's a 54% shooter. Rebounds nearly eight a game. Came over from St. Louis as a transfer, St. Louis University, and his dad joined the coaching staff, Norm Stewart. St. Louis so much better. They see what they won yesterday with that spoon ball. And they got those three guys that hit the shot from downtown, led by Irwin Clack. Hard outside, down to the corner. Henderson back out to the perimeter. Got to get Henderson off the nut here. 
Mark Reed. Reed back, Andre Patterson block. Back for it, and they run out of time. That's not a happy man. He's going to go back to 